There are certain things we do in the world that we can't do in the church. If you come to the front to dance, you didn't dance in your seat, but you decide to come to the front to dance. At that time, you are not dancing for yourself. You are dancing before the Lord. And sometimes I see ladies in the front dancing and wiggling their waist. I don't know whether to God or to me or to whoever. If you want to wiggle your waist, I have no problem, but go to your bedroom and wiggle your waist. When you're coming to church on Sunday, you should dress well. Why do we dress well on Sunday? Because we are presenting ourselves to God not to dress to show off our best dress some people actually come to church and steal do you love your life you come to church and steal I went today I just got two mobile phones some people see nice girls going to church on Sunday and they also walk and follow the girls to church on Sunday say challenge these days all the chicks are in the church oh. a lady is living in sin with somebody's husband or is fornicating boldly and brazenly comes and says I'm leading the people before God. That is a profane offering. This is Rich Nation WBPT Podcast. We introduce you to the people and ideas, and we bring people together. Games people play with God. You know, somehow, as Christians, we tend to sometimes play games with God, and we try to cut corners here, try to pretend here, some hypocrisy there. We all do it, myself included. All of us play games with God. And today, I want to walk you through some of the games we play with God. Although it's a game, sometimes the consequences are not funny. And so we're going to look at the games people play with God. And then we're going to look at the result of those games. The scoreline. And I'm looking at Adam and Eve. And we're going to look at six situations. Adam and Eve. They played the game that is called the blame game they played they blame others when their sins were found out and it's a game that people still play with God when they have done something wrong and it's brought to the attention they raise up all kinds of defenses or they come to church and they've done something wrong and the pastor preaches about it and they raise defenses. Sometimes they think, well, maybe somebody reported me to the pastor. Or then they'll say, oh, is he also perfect? We are nobody's perfect. And these are games that we play sometimes with God. Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. And we see how this game was played by Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. You know that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were placed in the garden of Eden. They were given a mandate to be fruitful, to multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. They were given awesome responsibility to rule over the earth and uh, they had quite a lot of good things happening to them. There were no discos, there were no nightclubs, there, there was no alcohol being sold on the street. There was nobody, just the two of them, but they still found a way to sin. Isn't it amazing that when people are alone and there is no temptation, they will tempt themselves. They will still find a way to sin. So just the two of them there, there was no third woman for Adam to be tempted. There was no third man for Eve to be tempted. Nothing. But they still found a way to sin. Genesis 3 verse 9 to 13. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. And on and on. I'm sure the woman had nobody else to blame but the serpent. Fortunately, the serpent had nobody to blame, so he had to take what came his way. But you see the blame game. It's a game we play with God. God's Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. And when we do something that is wrong, his Holy Spirit will convict us. Sometimes whilst you are doing it, you hear a voice inside you that says, stop it. Or somebody by chance makes a comment that is appropriate for your situation. No, you come to church and you hear a message and that speaks directly to the situation. God will always bring our sins to our attention. It is his job to make sure that when we go wrong, he draws our attention to it. Sometimes whilst you are reading your Bible, for some strange reason, your Bible reading verse for that day speaks about something in your life. 
or your devotional guide speaks about something in your life or you open to, to the radio station and somebody's preaching on the radio station and it's as if he read your email last night because he's talking directly about you or as if the preacher was hiding in your bedroom when you were fighting with your husband or your wife and they talk about it what do you do when you are brought face to face with your sin for Adam and Eve there were only two people they couldn't blame the government they couldn't blame their parents <laughs> that would be God they couldn't blame anybody else so they turned on each other and we do it a lot of time it's a game we play they did not acknowledge their own sins that the first thing when people do when they play this game they don't acknowledge they have sinned isn't it amazing sometimes some people sin they do the wrong thing everybody knows they've done the wrong thing they are the only ones who don't know they've done the wrong thing and Adam and Eve never acknowledge God says to Adam have you eaten of the tree of which I said you should not eat simple he should have said yes yes sir I'm sorry I did but he says the woman woman what have you done seven none of them acknowledge that they had sinned you know many times it's so difficult for us to acknowledge we have sinned that what we are doing is wrong that the relationship we are in is wrong and that money we are getting is from a wrong source we always want to blame people if my husband had not left me I wouldn't be in this situation and if my wife had been faithful I wouldn't be in this situation and if my wife had taken care of me I wouldn't be attracted to another woman don't acknowledge their own sin and as a result they shifted blame to others shifting of blame some people believe the reason they are committing adultery is because after their wife gave birth her stomach has become so big and she's not exercising so now it gives them the right to go and look for a slim woman who will also become big then they'll go to another one problem is not the size of your wife my friend it's your own problem of sin problem is not your husband it's you you are the one who has sinned and if like Adam and Eve you play games with God and start blaming people third thing that happens is that you fail to receive God's mercy and forgiveness I've always wondered what if Adam had said yes Lord I did it forgive me probably the history of the universe would have been very different maybe God would have forgiven him right there Christ would not have come to come and die for our sins again because the first man would have learned how to go to God directly for forgiveness of sins but he retained his own sin didn't go to God for mercy he didn't cry for God's mercy he didn't call for God's forgiveness all he did was shift the blame do you know that many times God wants to forgive us and have mercy on us and build our lives again but all we do is blame somebody else push the blame on somebody else blame the society blame where we live blame our poverty blame all everybody else except to say I have done what God said I shouldn't do so what is the result of playing this game with God it's a very expensive game because the result is separation from God that's the result and that's what happened to Adam and Eve they were moved away from the Garden of Eden place which was supposed to be their habitation they lost access to it and by doing that they affected all of us with separation from God if you don't acknowledge your sins if you blame others for your sins if you find excuses for your sins you get yourself separated from God but if you acknowledge your sins and I acknowledge my sins and I say God this is a problem this is a weakness in my life this is a sin in my life have mercy on me Lord forgive me give me the strength help me to deal with this so when you are confronted with it you don't blame other people you accept it you don't say well it's in my family that's how my father was that's how my brothers are that's how my mother was that's how my sisters are that's how we are in our family that's how we are and so what God is not dealing with your family he's dealing with you so don't play that game with God because the score line is not good you will be separated from him for a very very long time and for some people eternally separated from God and never finding peace both in this life and in the life after death so that's the first game we play with God blaming other people second game is the game of offering profane offerings to God there are two gentlemen who were the sons of a priest they were called Nadab and Abihu Nadab and Abihu remember their names because they played a very expensive game with God profane offering to God their story is in Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 to 3 they offered something to God 
but God didn't like what they offered. You know, it's, it's important for us to know that God has a way in which he wants us to worship him. And not every way is acceptable to him. And sometimes we think that God is so, probably so needy and so insecure that we can just uh, use the things we give him, bring it anyhow, and somehow buy his acceptance. But God has prescribed ways in which he wants us to worship him. Offering profane offerings to God is a game that people play with God. And here it reads, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Aaron was the father, his two sons, died and I'm sure he was getting worried what's happening I'm sure he was angry with God and he says well this is what God says if you're going to stand before me to minister you have to do it to glorify me you can't stand before God and offer him a profane offering you can't play those games with God and if you do the consequences can be very dire they can be very 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 serious consequences now what did Nadab and Abihu do the first thing you notice is that they disregarded God's specific instructions. God says they did something that I had not commanded them to do. So what was it that they did that they were not commanded to do? Two things that they did. One, under the regulations of the Old Testament, the fire for the censor, and the censor, uh, if you've been to the uh, Catholic Church or the Anglican Church, uh, that thing that they put the, um, the incense in, contraption, uh, it's called a censor. Now, under the Old Testament, the fire from the censer comes from a brazen altar, an altar in the holy place. And that is the only fire you could pick to put into the censer to offer an offering to God, to burn incense to God. Nadab and Abihu, their father was the high priest, Aaron. So they knew the instructions, but I guess they had become so familiar with the temple that they felt they could do it anyhow. So instead of taking fire from the place God said they should take fire, they just went out, picked ordinary fire, put it on the censer and tried to offer to God. So God called it profane fire because it didn't come from the place he wanted it. Secondly, the second thing that they did wrong was their father was the high priest. Under the Old Testament, the only person who had access to the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And he goes there once a year. That's their father. Obviously, they've seen their father go to the high priest to the Holy of Holies every time to offer sacrifice and they felt that they are related to the man and so if he can do it, they can also do it. So they said, well, if daddy does it, I can do it. So they went, they picked their censer, picked fire from the wrong place and entered the Holy of Holies because they were become so familiar with church that they have forgotten it was God's temple, not their father's temple and things went wrong. Remember, when we stand here to minister, it's not our church, it's God's church, it's God's house. In whatever capacity, whether preaching, singing, praise team, charisma, instrumentalists, ushers, all of us who serve in the house, we are serving in God's house, not our bedroom. And if we are serving in God's house, we have to serve in God's house with holiness. That simply means you can't go and do something nasty last night and come here and worship and lead the people to God. Now, I'm not saying the praise team had done something nasty. That's what happened. People become familiar. It's their job. They see it happening. So here is somebody, maybe a lady is living in sin with somebody's husband or is fornicating boldly and brazenly and then comes and says, I'm leading the people before God. That is a profane offering. That offering is not a joke. You may play a game with God, but the consequences, my friends, can be very, very serious. For each one of us who offer sacrifices to God, whatever we do in the temple of God, we must regard God's instruction. The second thing they did is that they mixed carnality and worldliness with their sacrifice. 
they mixed carnality they took they went to the world and took the fire and came to the temple and took the incense they took that which was of God and that which was of the world and tried to make it work and it can't work that way you can't play that game with God the consequences are not sweet now listen to me carefully there are certain things we do in the world that we can't do in the church for example please nobody should feel that I'm trying to pick on them I'm just trying to give some instruction on these things. If you come to the front to dance, you didn't dance in your seat, but you decide to come to the front to dance. At that time, you are not dancing for yourself. You are dancing before the Lord because you've come before the congregation of the Lord to dance. So you must be careful what kind of dance offering we are presenting to God because some dance offerings are profane offerings. That does not mean everybody should go in a circle and clap their hands you know, uh, Bobobo style. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is be aware that what you are doing, you are doing before the Lord. So check your clothing before you come before the Lord and ask yourself, does this attire represent God's glory when I come to dance? This dance movement, does it represent God's glory? And sometimes I see ladies in the front dancing and wiggling their waist. I don't know whether to God or to me or to whoever. If you want to wiggle your waist, I have no problem. But go to your bedroom and wiggle your waist. But don't move out of the congregation to stand before the Lord and give that offering. It's a profane offering. And that kind of offering is not acceptable before God. Third thing God said about the offering of Nadab and Abihu is that they failed to glorify God with their actions. They just did it to have fun, to entertain themselves, to just rejoice. Remember, when we dance in church, we are not dancing to feel happy. We are not doing what Osibisa says, dance the body music. We are not dancing just to be happy. Hey, the church was sweet, oh, the way we shook our bodies. No, you don't come to shake your bodies. You come to offer a sacrifice to God. And so when you come, the moment you step out to be here, and that doesn't mean don't come here and dance again. I want to see more of you coming here to dance. But the moment you stand here to dance, remember, it's not to show to the congregation. It's not to show off my dancing step. It's to offer my gratitude to God and to thank Him for what He has taken me through throughout this week and bringing me before His presence. This is my sacrifice of praise. And you offer it to God. It's not about showmanship. It is all to the glory of God. So what was the consequence of playing that game? What was the result? The result was not good. They were consumed by fire. May God deliver you from that. I need you alive, please, in this house. So make sure that you don't play that game with God. Offering profane offerings. A profane offering can be anything. It can be profane money. It can be profane whatever. Things that are not worthy that we present to God. And I believe that when you're coming to church on Sunday, you should dress well. I mean, why do we dress well on Sunday? Because we are presenting ourselves to God. Not to dress to show off our best dress, our best clothing. We are coming to say, Lord, look at us. We respect you so much. When we are coming before your presence, we take time to have a good bath, brush our teeth well so there will not be bad odor, clean ourselves well, Put deodorant under our armpits so that we will not disturb your presence and come here and get some nice cologne on our bodies and present ourselves because you are our king of kings. Because if you are going to meet normal person, the president of Ghana or some person, you would take time to present yourself well. And that's how we do it when we come before God. So our offering is a sweet smelling offering. Third game that people play with God. I call it crooked deals. And the example is a young man called Gehazi. Gehazi is an interesting young man. I don't know whether he was a Ghanaian or Nigerian, but he's a very interesting man, Gehazi. But when I see, read the story of Gehazi, it's a story that you see a lot of our young men here can identify with, looking for quick deal, smart way of making it. Now, if you want to make it smart, try and do it your way, but don't add God to it. Because once you implicate God in a crooked deal, you have some serious scoreline coming your way. Second Kings chapter 5 verse 20 and then we'll jump to verses 20, 25 to verse 27. The story is very interesting about this young man who felt that he was so smart, he had opportunity and he felt he could twist 
the word of God and the presence and the power of God around to make a quick buck. Gehazi was the servant of a prophet. I'm sure Gehazi was a Ghanaian. His name even starts with G. Gehazi. There's H there. There's A there. Gehazi. Make Gehanian. Let's read. It says, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said. Now, let me give you the background. You know the background of the story. A rich general called Naaman had leprosy on his body somebody advises him to go to to Samaria because there's a prophet called Elisha and Elisha will help him out he goes and Elisha says go and wash in the pool seven times in the river Jordan he goes to wash seven times and he's cleansed of his leprosy he's so grateful he comes to Elisha and tries to give him gifts and Elisha says no 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 that's all right thank you go but God bless you just worship God and Gehazi looks at that and he thinks this is a missed opportunity so let's read. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman. Now note the phrase he used. He has spared, spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Go to verse 25. So he went and he said, well, you know, told a lie and got the things. Verse 25. Now he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, where did you go Gehazi and he said your servant did not go anywhere then he said to him did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you is it time to receive money and to receive clothing olive groves and vineyards sheep and oxen male and female servants therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever and he went from his presence leprous as white as snow quick deals in the house of God now what was the problem with Gehazi he did not value the principles of financial discipline that Elisha preached he felt Elisha was an old man who doesn't understand money in this modern world that he had money but he, he didn't know how to take it he was sparing people he says he has spared Naaman because many of us don't want to spare even the church Sometimes people do things for the church and they don't spare the church. They would chop because they would say, hey, this is our time. Didn't spare the church. And Gehazi didn't spare Naaman. And he had no respect and no value for his master's financial discipline. Secondly, he took advantage of his position to illegally acquire wealth. Proximity to the man of God, to the presence of God. It's almost like somebody who works in my office who says, well, before you see Pastor Otabel, you know, the man is a very busy man, but if you can just give me some one or two thousand, I can make a way for you. Now, that is a Gehazi spirit, and thank God nobody does that around you. But in case anybody does that, then the score line is not good for them. It's a crooked lifestyle. Sometimes people have the Gehazi spirit. They work in a place, maybe they work in a school, a secondary school, and uh, when it's time, SSS, senior secondary school to open, and they, they are probably just somebody who works near the office. This is their cocoa season. And they use the position to amass wealth. It's the spirit of Gehazi. And it's a game we play with God. But it's worse when it's done in the house of God, at whatever level. The other time we had a function in the church, and um, we had... 800 people or so attending and we had bought about 800 or 900 cans of coca-cola 900 the people were 800 100 to spare we arranged them outside here and after the function we said each one just take one and remember your brothers by the time the first battalion went through there was no coca-cola left it is the Gehazi spirit. They don't spare Naaman. Tell them, have one. They have three. You put sandwiches there. You say, pick one. They pick four. They don't want to spare the opportunity. It's a Gehazi spirit. You can play it with you and your children at home, but don't bring it to God. Because if you do, you're going to have some serious things happening to you. You call curses upon yourself that haunt you for your life and then you wonder, why is my life going this way? It's the Gehazi spirit. It affects you and nothing works for you because you see an opportunity and you want to cheat or maybe you're working for a Christian brother and you're cheating him, your own brother in Christ. You're selling something to him more than the price and you know you're not giving him a good deal but you know he's a Christian. And you know he may never find out, but you know you didn't treat him well, is the spirit of Gehazi. 
It's a game we play. He couldn't wait for his time of promotion. Elisha said to him, is this the time to have olive groves? Is this the time to have horses? What Elisha was saying is that there will come a time when you will have all these things, but this is not the time for it. The Gehazis, they're too hasty to make it. So they steal, they lie, they cheat. Some people actually come to church and steal. You know, listen to me. Do you love your life? You come to church and steal. And you think it's fun. Yeah, I went today. I just got two mobile phones. Do you know what you are bringing upon yourself? And not only yourself, but upon your descendants. Your children are not yet born, but you are consigning them to destruction. Even before they are born. They are grandchildren. Because that's what Elisha says. He says, leprosy is going to cling on you and your descendants. So what was the result? He was afflicted with disease and curses. Don't play that game, my friend. Don't play that game. Don't capitalize on your proximity to the church, to Christians, to the things of God, and try to make maximum money out of it. Don't do a contract for the church and cheat the church. Not only our church, any church. Don't do a project for a Christian and cheat him. Don't promise a Christian something, child of God, who has trusted you simply because you also said you're a believer and then cheat him. When you do that, there may not be Elisha to pronounce curse, but the curse is already hanging in the air. Elisha has already pronounced it. It's looking for a Gehazi. And the moment you show yourself as a Gehazi, it will land upon you. All of a sudden, you're getting sick by heart and nothing is working for you and everything you touch is bad. No contract is working and, and no business is working. Doors open, they close and all of that. And then your children are suffering and, and nothing is, seems to be working for generations after you. Check back and you will see a Gehazi crooked way sometime in your life. Fourth game. The fourth game we play with God is the game Jonah played, running from God. There are people who have been called by God who are running away from God. And I'm not saying called by God simply just because God, they have to be pastors, but God has given an, an assignment, but they find excuses and they're running away. And that's what happened to Jonah. His story is in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and then uh, verses 15 to 17. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up to me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship among going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What was Jonah's problem? He moved away from the direction God was leading him. God was leading him one way, he went the opposite direction. Those who play this game with God, they know what God has called them to do, what God is telling them to do, but they don't want to do it. And it could be that God is calling you into the ministry. He says, ah, I'll be poor. I won't have any money. Well, if God says he needs you, you have no excuse. He brought you here, he'll take you out, and he says he needs you. You have no excuse. For some people, God is calling them to offer a certain service. Maybe you are in the church and always you come to the church and God is telling you, maybe join the ushers or do something else. But you don't want to do it for whatever reason. Or maybe God puts it on your heart. Give 100 Ghana cities to that young man there. He needs it. You say, God, but I can't. I don't even know him. But he's, God says, I know him. He's been talking to me. He needs money. Go and give him the money. If you keep running away, things may not work out well for you. So Jonah moved in the opposite direction. He preoccupied himself with his own selfish interests. The interesting thing when you study the story of Jonah, even when he went to the boat and there was trouble, the Bible says he was sleeping. He just went to the ship, went to the bottom part of the ship and slept. And he didn't care about what was happening. He didn't care what would happen to anybody. He was just having his rest. Sometimes God wants to interrupt your rest. Some people come to church and they decide they want to be far away. They don't want to commit to anything. 
but they come to church all the time. But they don't want to commit to anything. They want to sleep. And God is telling them, listen, I want you to get involved. I want you to be an, a counselor. I want you to teach a Bible class. I want you to help the children. I, I want to use you. I've given you gifts. I, want, I need to use you. Do you want to have your sleep? And Jonah was having his sleep when the people went and picked him up and said, Hey, 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 when everybody's drowning, look at what you're doing, sleeping. What's wrong with you? That's when they discovered later that he was the cause of the problem and he was sleeping. And not only did he preoccupy himself with his selfish interests, he invested his resources in the wrong things. He had money and he invested it in a fair that would take him out of the presence of God. Wrong investment. Some people have money, they put it in the wrong things. Some of us support all kinds of courses and we support all kinds of things and all, and most of the things really are not the things God wants you to invest your money and time in. But we put all our time, all our talents, all our energies, all our efforts into some group and some society somewhere. We are so passionate about it, but when it comes to the things of God, we have no passion. It's a game and if God is speaking to you and you're playing that game with him, the result is a miserable life. And that's what happened to Jonah. He had a miserable life. I'm telling you, there's nothing more miserable than spending three days of your life struggling with the gastric and digestive juices in the stomach of a fish and living with other fish and squid and other shrimp all in the stomach of the fish. That's a miserable life. When you run away from God and you run away from his call on your life and what he's demanding from you and make all kinds of excuses and talk about I don't have time and I, don't, I can't do this and I can't do that, you attract misery to your life. You don't find the joy and fulfillment that God wants your life to have. You don't find the significance that God wants your life to have. If he is calling you, don't play games with him and run away. You have to answer his call. The fifth game that people play with God, public deception, corporates, Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira are one of those people who will be in church and when you say, we want to raise money, they will get up and say, I pledge 20 million. And you never find them again. They talk big publicly, perform little in reality. They enjoy giving big impressions about themselves, but when it comes to doing what they have committed to do, they don't do it. There are people like that in church. Public deception is a game. Acts chapter 5 verse 1 to 5. What was happening in the church at that time was um, people were giving to the church because it was a time of great revival and people were selling their properties and donated it to the church so that they would feed the hungry, feed widows, feed orphans. And the church was just growing because people became so generous. And in the midst of that, Ananias and Sapphira got up and said, we will also give our house and our land. And everybody turns and says, wow, Ananias, wow, Sapphira, God bless you. You are generous. May the Lord increase you and multiply you and make you a thousand times more. They received the blessing. And when it was time, they shortchanged God. It says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. What really impressed me in this narrative is what Peter says. He says, the land, it was yours. Even after you sold it, the money was yours. Nobody had forced you to donate the land. Nobody has forced you to give the money. You came by yourself. In other words, God is not forcing you to make a pledge. But if you make a pledge, you must fulfill your pledge. It's not by force. You may see people doing it. If you don't feel led to do it, don't do it. But if you make a commitment, you have to honor it. Public deception, you find it all over. I will do this. I will do that. I will donate that. I will do that. But when it comes to delivery, we don't show up. Some people have reputations, big reputations, but very little performance. And why did things go wrong for Ananias and Sapphira? Peter said they opened their heart to Satan's lies and deception. They believed they could gain the respect of the church without paying the price for it. They could be seen as givers without giving. They could be seen as generous people without being generous. That's a lie. 
They opened their heart to Satan's lies and deception. Secondly, they conspired to deceive the church through false impression. They planned it. And believe you me, I've been a Christian for quite a while and I've seen people conspire to deceive. Sometimes even preachers conspire to deceive. They pick up a verse and they know where the verse is headed and they know what they want to achieve and they know exactly what they want to do but they will say the Holy Ghost told them to do it. And it wasn't the Holy Ghost. They just wanted to get the money. It's deception. And if you conspire to deceive, it's like two people who are going to a meeting years ago and one said to the other, when you hear me praying in tongues in a certain way, you must rise up here and you must also interpret what I'm saying. And you have to say it this way because this is what they had conspired to do. And they think they're playing games with God. They're playing games with God. This one, it's, it has a high tag on this game. Thirdly, they took back that which they had publicly dedicated to God. You publicly dedicate something to God. You say, publicly, I've given this to God. You don't take it back. If you publicly dedicate it to God, it belongs to God. Whilst it remains your own, it's your own. But the moment you say it's God, it's God. It is the same with the tithe, with the first fruit, with the offerings, with everything that we give to God. The result, premature death. It's not pleasant. The man died. The Bible puts it this way. He breathed his last. That's quite an interesting way of putting it. He just, I can almost imagine the moment Peter said that he breathed deep. And that's it. He was gone. He breathed his last. And then his wife came. They asked the wife, uh, is this how much building costs? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's how much it costs. So you've brought all the money you promised God. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is it. This is it. We've given all our heart. God knows our heart. Pure, simple. The Lord knows where our heart is. Peter said, well, your husband just breathed his last and they've gone to bury him. And she also, <sighs> down. Don't deceive God. Be honest. If you can do it, do it. If you can't do it, don't do it. If you can't give it all, just come and say, I can only give this. But don't make a promise when you don't want to fulfill it. It's a game and it's a very expensive game. The final game that we talk about is fake spirituality. The culprit, seven sons of Siva. Siva was a Jewish religious leader and he had seven sons. They felt their father was a rabbi or a spiritual person. So they could also play spiritual games. And believe you me, in my Christian life, I've even seen people who study tongues and learn a certain phrase and speak it to impress people that their tongues are deep. Okay, let's see what happens to such people. Acts chapter 19 verse 13 to 16. At this time, so many things were happening. Paul is being used tremendously by God. So much so that the Bible says that handkerchiefs or aprons from his body were taken out uh, to lay on the sick people and people were getting healed. Things were happening. Demons were being cast out. And as you know, a demon had just been cast out from a fortune-telling demon. And so things, great things are happening in the church. And people saw the display of the power of God. Then the Bible says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, empowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It's interesting, the Bible draws a distinction between the voice of the demon and the man in whom the demon was. The attack was not made by the demon per se, but the man who was demon possessed did it. But the questioning, Jesus I know, Paul I know, was from the demon. The demon had recognition of Paul and Jesus. So what happened to these people? They had no personal relationship with Christ. They didn't know him. They were not born again. And so they would say in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, fake spirituality. They talk the language, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, I'm saved, I'm born again, but they're not born again. There are people who come to church and sit in church for a long time and never get born again. But they know the pastor, they know the language of the church, they know how things are done, and they do things like everybody, and everybody thinks they are born again Christians, but they are not. They're just following the routines around them. Coming to church does not make you a child of God. Knowing me so terrible is good. It's good to know me. I believe I'm a great guy, you must know. But that doesn't make you a child of God. Coming to my church, I like the numbers. But that doesn't make you a child of God. 
shaking my hand doesn't make you a child of God. It's a nice hand to shake, but it doesn't make you a child of God. Even having an appointment with me does not make you a child of God. Me visiting your house does not make you a child of God. The only thing that makes you a child of God is for Jesus to come and live inside you. That's the only thing that makes you a child of God, for Jesus to come and live inside you. Main Sotable can live in your house, but that just means you have extra guests in your home. All that it means is that you have to spend more money to feed me when I'm in your house. But when Jesus comes into your life, he changes your life. It's not about which church you attend or which pastor you know or who your father is or who your grandfather is. It's about whether Jesus is in your heart. The sons of Siva, their father was a priest, a high priest, but they didn't know Christ. Relationship with a spiritual person does not make you a child of God. You need to know Jesus personally on a personal basis. So that's the first thing. Secondly, they follow the crowd without conviction. They follow the crowd without conviction. Everybody say, yeah, 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 yeah. They also said, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, oh, yeah. Jesus, oh, yeah, yeah. They also said it. Chobwe, yeah, chobwe, yeah. But they didn't know Jesus. They were following the crowd. Some people see nice girls going to church on Sunday and they also walk and follow the girls to church on Sunday. Say, Charlie, these days all the chicks are in the church. Oh, Charlie. No, I don't mind following the chicks to church. But when you come, you must find Jesus. The chicks may lead you to church, but you must find Jesus. I don't come here and be looking around, Charlie. Have you checked that one? Check that one. She's not bad. Oh, she's not bad. After church, I'll see her. And then you go and you go and say, Praise the Lord. You know, I'm also a child of God. I'm also born again. And you are not born again one little bit. You are just a pure old sinner. Just joking with Christianity. You are not born again. You are not committed to Christ. You are living a rotten old sinful life. You've not given any part of your life to Christ. But you come to church every Sunday fake spirituality for third they try to show off imitation spiritual power imitation spiritual power they they said what they've heard some people come to church long enough they hear people speaking in tongues they also start saying ba 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 are you a goat or a sheep can't you say anything more than ba 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 what's wrong with you it's imitation you've heard people say things so you say it let the holy spirit fill you properly the score line and the result is demonic attack it's important that we don't fake our spirituality whatever we do let's do it well if you're not filled the holy spirit don't pretend as if you are filled the Holy Spirit. Seek the real Holy Spirit. Don't fake it. Don't go about talking big. Yeah, you know, we can, we can do this. We can do this. And, and I saw a vision. You didn't see anything. I saw a dream. I had a revelation. You didn't have any revelation. No revelation. You know it. You didn't see anything. When you sleep, you are like a log. You sleep till the next morning. You don't see anything. But you've heard people say they had a vision. So you also say, I also had a vision. How did the vision look like? I had a dream. And the, the Lord spoke to me in the Holy Ghost. What did the Holy Ghost say? Do you know the Holy Ghost himself? But people come around church and they learn all this language. And if you're not careful, they come around you and they put out the right thing. The Holy Ghost, you know, the Holy Ghost is moving. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is moving. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. And then you see their lives, their crooks, their liars, their cheats. They're doing all the wrong things. But they know the vocabulary. They have learned how to say it. That's what happened. In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches I'm sure that one they said it quietly and thank God they were dealing with an enlightened demon he was not an ignorant demon who didn't know his rights he knew who could talk to him and who couldn't talk to him who can command him who can command him he says hey 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 hey, hey. I'm not cheap you can't just come and bully me around here Jesus I know Paul I know you I don't know you fake spirituality and we have too many of such people who talk all the spiritual language but their lives are rotten crooks they are cheap but they know how to say the right thing. These are the six games that sometimes all of us play in different measures before God. If you play in any of those games, time up, full time, extra time, time up, stop playing the game and get back to God in truth and in spirit. Why don't we just talk to him for a moment? If you want to support our podcast and stay informed about our latest episodes, we're always creating new content every week for our podcast. Subscribing is the best way to ensure that you don't miss out on any of it. Please hit the subscribe button. We really appreciate it. God blesses you all and be legendary, my friends.